This episode is proudly supported by Open Table. Nearly one third of diners are booking same day. So they're making those decisions on the spot. And 10% are, do- are making their bookings within just a few hours. And so it's why it's so important to have you know, booking software like Open Table, which allows your diners to discover you. And so when restaurants are on platforms like Open Table, they're much more likely to be discovered. We help diners to connect to restaurants. Ultimately, having technology, using technology, helps you to reattach to those diners. Experience the power of Open Table. For an exclusive offer, visit restaurant.opentable.com.au forward slash DITW. I'm not one to certainly plan out a menu, maybe to my own detriment. It's really good to be able to just turn up and have those those staff that will you can throw a bit of a spanner and say, oh, we're going to do this tonight or we'll do this tomorrow or this is coming off and everybody... Um, Everyone jumps in. Today on Dirty Linen, we are heading to the Blue Mountains, a beautiful part of the world that I have not visited for way too long. So we're going there in audio. Today's guest is William Cowan Lunn. Will owns Artesh and Zoe's in Blackheath. Uh, He's cooked in various restaurants around the country. We'll certainly dig into that as well as life as a restaurateur. Will, welcome to Dirty Linen. Hi, Danny. Great to have you on the show. I think where I'd love to start is for you to just set the scene of your restaurants in Blackheath because it's a pretty special place. Yeah, Blackheath is, well, I feel probably the most beautiful town in the mountains. Um, It's pretty much right at the top just before Mount Victoria. Um, Right now it's cold and misty like uh, many days up here. Um, but yeah, it's a, it's a lovely little town. We, um, get hit pretty hard by tourists on the weekend cause there's lots of great walks in the national park. Um, yeah. And I've got, uh, Atesh, which was formerly, um, Fumo and before that was Vesta and before that was Philip Searle's Vulcans and, um, was always one of my favorite restaurants and, if I could have a restaurant or emulate one, it was going to be Vulcan. So I feel very fortunate to actually be uh, standing in the same site as he was. Yeah, I just got a little chill thinking about it. It's pretty amazing. For people who don't know about Philip Searle, you know, a legend of um, Australian hospitality, can you just fill us in a little bit? Well, he he and I believe Neil Perry, which I you know was fortunate fortunate enough to work with for quite a few years, really introduced that um, fusion cooking in Australia. And um, Vulcans was open, I think, three days a week. It had no sign out the front. Um, Philip spent most of his time out the back preparing the um, signature dishes like the checkerboard ice cream. And the menu didn't change much. He always had the... um, duck sausage on and pickled beetroot and um yeah it was handwritten menus uh very loud the acoustics in the restaurant are still very loud it's all hard surfaces um but yeah it was people would go there for just really good food and um i wouldn't say low-key service but it was certainly something that was um yeah very casual um but yeah, just uh, emphasis on how good the food and technique was. And uh, am I right in thinking, Will, that you've resurrected a few Vulcans dishes at Artesh? We, when we first opened, we yeah, we put a bit of a spin on the the duck sausage, duck neck sausage. We would you know do a whole duck with pickled beetroot garnish, and um, I would. I hate to use the word deconstructed for some reason, but um, the checkerboard ice cream, we were doing the same flavours, but more in an ice cream, granita and panna cotta um, way. Um, At the moment, I don't really have anything on that's an ode to Philip Searle. I think we, yeah, the menu changes quite often, Um, but the Sauterne Custard actually is another one of his, which I first had at Mark and um, 
and then getting in contact with Mark Bess, um, he actually looked back through the years and realised that it was another one that had come from Philip Searle. So, yeah. It's so interesting. I'd love to draw a map of some of these dishes and, yeah, even elements that have followed chefs and restaurants around the country. It'd be so, yeah, so fascinating and, and so nice to honour um, honor that heritage. Uh, so, Will, cooking, There's the fire has been a big uh, feature of, you know, whichever restaurant has been in that space. Can you t- tell us how it um, features in the current incarnation? Yeah, it's, um, uh, I've heard rumours it's 150 years old. I think it's probably about 100, and, I think about 130. Um, but uh, yeah, first bakery in Blackheath. Uh, it could have been the first bakery in the Upper Mountains, actually, and it's um, it's ginormous. It's a yeah Scotch oven, and my thoughts are that it was a communal oven, and that people would bring their pots and their um, stews and braises and utilize the back of the oven for that, and then the front of the oven where most of the heat is would be for the um, baking of the bread. So, yeah, we've, it's fired up every day. Um, we cook all our proteins in there, vegetables, um, our sourdough, focaccia, um, which also needs a little bit of a help in the combi oven, if I'm going to be honest, because the temperature of the wood fire oven, you, you can get it as hot as about 400 degrees close to the fire, but it's really meant for slow cooking. So it it, during service, it probably sits at about 180, and then during the day, um, we'll get it up to about 250, and then just let it die down, and then just keep feeding it with um, the iron bark, which is also supplied by a company just down the road, the Blackheath Firewood. Are you, it's it's like an animal that you have to keep like tending and feeding, isn't it? Am I right in thinking that the 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 feature that makes a Scotch oven a Scotch oven is that it's sort of all insulated with sand? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, it's um, it took us I reckon about two weeks before we opened to actually get it heated up again. It um, it had been not yeah it hadn't been used for about a year and. It's just got so – it's like triple brick, just like the restaurant is actually. Um, and, yeah, you know, so every day we're, we'd light it up and get it cranking and then let it cool down and close the flute and that really holds in the temperature. And so we get back in the morning and it's sitting at about 80 degrees. Yeah, beautiful. And um, one restaurant isn't enough trouble for you, Will. So tell us about Zoe's. Uh, yeah, so there was a restaurant just next door to us and I think they couldn't find their way out of the, the fires that we had up here a couple of years ago or probably three years ago now. That was quite devastating for a lot of small business. And then COVID and um, so the opportunity, we were looking at another site um, we were actually looking out at the botanical gardens um, out Mount Wilson way, but yeah, this um, space came up next door, and it's we uh, we got the keys, and then within a month and a half, we were open and um, new liquor paint, and we moved the. Uh, it's a live live music venue, so we moved the stage from. Uh, it was at the front of the restaurant, so we moved it to the back and opened it up. And now we, um, yeah, we're open five nights a week and putting on probably the most gigs I think in the mountains. Um, yeah, and it's a bit of a broad range of Mexican snacks and a few main plates and uh, some really good cocktails. Yeah, so and, and it works really well. I mean, the staff can kind of go between both restaurants they're connected to each other at the back and um yeah it's it's been great it's it has it has been hard um and yeah i think having those two options is really good a a tesh is a little bit more on the uh dare i say fine dining style it's 
yeah, it's it's sort of a mix between that and a bit of casual and shared plates. Whereas uh, Zoe's next door is um, yeah, good bang for your buck tacos and a bit of a lighter options. So yeah, I really get the sense of um, you know being in in a regional town. You know, you're running these businesses that are really part of the the life of the community. It's um, sort of you you seem quite interwoven with different aspects of. Um, yeah, the way people, uh, you know, plan their week and um, enjoy themselves as well as, of course, catering to tourists. Yeah, there's there's not a lot of options in the mountains. In Katoomba, there certainly is. Um, in Blackheath, there's there's probably a cafe every second, <laughs> every second uh, block, every second building probably. Um, and my business partner, he's ran the Victory Cafe, which is also on Govett Sleep Road. And that's about 50 metres up the road. He's been running that for 20 years. Um, so, yeah, it's uh, we, we definitely accommodate to locals and, and especially on those weekends, it's, um, yeah, a lot of Sydney ciders, which is, which is great. Um, so, Will, you've cooked in Sydney, you've cooked in Melbourne, you're now in the um, Blue Mountains. Can you just explain the course of your career? Where, where did it start? Uh, yeah, it's. I started at a really busy cafe in um, Martin Place as a first year apprentice, uh, a cafe called Paradiso. There was a, there's quite a few of them around the city, and growing up in Borkham Hills, so I'd be catching the train at about six a.m. in the morning, and I did work experience at this cafe in Year Ten, and they offered me an apprenticeship, so I um, took that up. And then I moved, eventually moved into the city in, in a couple of years later and started working at Wildfire, which was down at the uh, overseas passenger terminal. So, yeah, I went from like a 40-seat cafe to a 300-seat churrasco Brazilian-inspired restaurant with all, um, yeah, open flame cooking. And it was huge. The team of about 40 chefs. So that was a, um, yeah, that was quite different, but loved it. And then um, I spent, I think I spent a year and a half or two years there. And then I did my last year of my apprenticeship at Tetsuya's. And that was, I think, circa 2003, 2002, 2003, uh, which was uh, amazing. Again, it was going from a cafe to then a huge restaurant and then to a, uh, slightly smaller restaurant, but still, you know, there's about 16 chefs in the kitchen. And uh, it was a time where, you know, most of those chefs that I uh, worked with are all still really good friends and doing amazing things in Sydney and abroad. And um, yeah, and then I think I got, I moved to the city when I was 17. So after about five, six years, I, I think I sort of wore myself out. So Mum and Dad had moved to the Blue Mountains in that time. So I uh, moved up here and spent a couple of years cooking at Silks Brasserie in Lura, which was a bit of a, another institution of the mountains, which has actually just closed after 25 years. And, um, and then I headed overseas. I went to London and then I travelled Europe and ended up in Scotland, in Edinburgh for a couple of years and um, worked at Martin Wishart's, which was Michelin star restaurant down on the water of Leith, which was fantastic. Many, many hours, freezing temperatures, but um, I'd, I'd do it in a heartbeat again. And I, uh, yeah, I really loved it. Small team, fantastic food. And, um, and then when I came back to Sydney, I then – Got reacquainted with Philip Wood, and um, who I worked at Tattoos with, and he'd just been given the head chef position at Rockpool on George Street, the original one. So I went and joined him for a couple of years, and then um, yeah, made my way down to Melbourne and worked down there at Rockpool Bar and Grill for another two years, and then uh, my wife at the time and I had our first child, so we. Yeah, always loved the Blue Mountains, so we made our way up here. Wow. It's, it's so 
such a, yeah, I mean, such different restaurants that you've worked at. I mean, is it, what was it? Was it restaurants that swept you up? Was it a desire to keep learning about different styles of cooking? I mean, was it just, I don't know, the wherever the road took you next? Like, was it, yeah, how do you sort of make sense of it in retrospect? Yeah, oh, look, I look back and I think I definitely, if there was an opportunity to go somewhere, I, I took it and um i yeah i just loved i loved learning i I still do i loved working in kitchens and god if i think of the amount of hours that myself and many chefs of my age and older have have done um again i wouldn't change a thing but yeah i think i i don't know i i probably you know in hindsight maybe i moved around too much but i think that's was just part of my life as well i'm sure of where to settle down and whatnot but um yeah i think i think yeah i mean there's so many different styles of food there isn't there from you know brazilian style mediterranean at wildfire and then to japanese french at tetsuya's and rockpool was i think rockpool was where i really found my feet i think that beautiful mix of cantonese and Sichuan cooking and um but very simple and effective uh, Mediterranean food. And, um, yeah, and everything that I learned overseas in, um, in Edinburgh and London was – I don't think I've ever worked with such good seafood as I have, in, especially in Edinburgh. Um, and the, the game and all the meat over there was, was fantastic. Vegetables were probably not on par of what we've got here, but certainly the – Certainly all the crustaceans and seafood in general. Mm, those cold waters. Oh, yeah. Um, amazing. So, Will, do you feel like you've sort of come out of all these different experiences with a style that you would call your own? Like, do you feel like you are a certain sort of cook or do you feel like, you know, you, you're always going to be, I don't know, looking at the venue and sort of feeling out what it wants to be? Yeah, that's a, that's a good point. I think... There's um, at Atesh we we certainly change the menu often. Um, we're about to go seven nights a week, so it kind of limits us to really how much time and effort we put into a single dish. Say, you know, reflecting on the time at Tetsuya's, you'd be one chef just working on one dish all day. Um, so, yeah, it's. Yeah, I um, I don't know. I, I think Mark Best said it to Phil and I once at Rockpool when he had a dish and he said that, you know, you can make – you can come up with an amazing dish but if you don't sit down in the restaurant and eat it, it's, it, it might make sense and it might not. And I've always taken that, taken that from um, – and I'm sure he doesn't even remember telling us that. But uh, that's something definitely at Atesh. I've come up with dishes and I think, oh, this is great, but – it just doesn't work, yeah, specifically in our restaurant. But, you know, 90% of the time it does and I think it's very easy, tasty food. Um, nothing is overcomplicated. I try and, um, yeah, try and keep it to, you know, three or four main ingredients and if that sometimes, utilising the wood fire oven and charcoal, charcoal cooking and, um yeah, I, I can't say – I don't really spend too much time making uh, heavy sauces and chicken stock every day. I think we, it's it's very light and fresh food. Um, considering how far we are from the fish markets, we do have quite an abundance of fish on the menu. But I um, go down there every week and pick out what we're going to have for the week. Um, yeah, so it's – yeah. I mean, what's a dish that you think really speaks to what you're doing there? Um, we we always have a galette on, like a fried potato galette, which always changes its garnish every um, every couple of months. Generally, raw fish, and um, yeah, we'll always have. I mean, the the ducks. We're not we don't do duck at the moment, but the duck was something that was. I guess the cynicture, we would um, poach them and then dry them out. We can utilize the huge cool room that we have at Zoe's as opposed to a Tesh. 
So we dry them out for at least a week and then we roast them in the wood fire oven, cool them down, break them down, and then um, and then we deep fry them and then serve them with a yeah whatever garnish at the time. Whether it was we make our own hoisin sauce, which was something that I take from Rockpool and make some shallot pancakes and um, or like I said when we first opened it was some pickled beetroot and roasted grapes um, yeah so when it comes to I guess the cynicture not too sure exactly what we have that is uh, consistently on the menu there's a really lovely beetroot dish with tahini and green olives and pickled onions that has been on, I think, now for about nine months. That's a, that's a tough one to take off. Hey, I would be, I would be all over that. I mean, I have to say, everything that you're talking about sounds super tasty. Um, Will, you've worked for some really, you know, renowned restaurateurs, but you've got your own businesses now. What have been some of the challenges in being a restaurateur? Um, look, I think every restaurant that I've worked for certainly in a senior position, I've tried to treat as my own. Um, I guess when you've got your own investments in it, it's then a different story. And um, yeah, I think challenges is is generally staying afloat, staying a you know in in the mountains, it's it's it is weather dependent as well. I mean, I go down to Sydney quite regularly and that that place is you know any night of the week it is pumping the restaurants are so busy down there and um we can always guarantee you know friday saturday sunday that we're busy those other nights of the week it yeah it can be quite weather dependent and it sometimes feels like a bit of a sleepy town so yeah i think it's the rising costs of our you know, we, we own the building here at Atesh, which is fantastic, and the rising costs of rates and produce, um, you know, gas, electricity, it all goes up, and it's, it's, it is certainly hard to then justify raising your prices, especially in a quite a small town. We've got a hat now, but that doesn't necessarily mean that we, um, you know, food, uh, produce st- still costs the same as it does you know, ref, restaurants down in Sydney. And, um, yeah, I think that's probably just a constant battle is finding that happy medium of being able to still be a restaurant that locals can come and you know, enjoy and not feel like it's burning a hole in the wallet, um, but also trying to stay ahead of, yeah, the um, the outgoings. It's, um, yeah. Yeah. On, ongoing tricky equation what's the thinking then in opening seven nights well at the moment i have when we first opened um it was pretty much just myself and another chef max who has worked with me for years and now as you know, i've got now i've got the two businesses i'm really trying to work on the business and um not for the business or in the business and um I certainly have a, a lot more staff now, so I feel like I can I can open open more. I'm still paying the same amount of same mortgage, and the you know I don't think my wages are really going to increase because I've got the amount of, I've got the staff that I can spread them out over the seven nights a week, um, and I just think every every little bit helps at the moment. I can um, everyone can still everyone's always worked four days three days off here. And um, I have my girls. I've got two little girls that go to school just up the road. So, you know, my, my days are set with them. And, um, yeah, I think it's just – it's not like it's breaking point or anything like that. Certainly certainly not. I don't think anyone gets into a small business, small restaurant to be uh, floating in profits or whatnot. I think it is um, – we've got the staff and, um, yeah, I – you know, I think the the clientele can be here on a, certainly on a Monday, Tuesday. I think we'd I think we'd be the only restaurant that is actually open seven nights a week in the mountains, and um, yeah, we'll see how it goes. That's that's really all I can do. Yeah, well, I guess there's yeah, I guess you pull the levers that you've got available to you, don't you? That's right. Yeah. Yeah. So, what are the joys of having a business? Oh, look. I, 
yeah, I, did, I don't want to sound like it's uh, <laughs> it's all tough and it certainly is. I remember Neil saying if it was easy, everyone would do it, and um, which is, again, another – I don't want to keep regurgitating quotes or whatnot, but it's uh, – no, I've got a fantastic team up here. I really do. Like I've got – I've got um, from spending a, a year down at the Black Cockatoo Bakery in um, in the Blue Mountains. I've uh, I've now got some of those. They're ex staff, and we um, yeah. I think it's we've got a little veggie garden, like a well, I shouldn't say little, decent sized kitchen garden out in the in the back car park, and um, I love it. I love the fact that we can I can turn up, and I, I'm not one to certainly plan out a menu maybe to my own detriment, um, months in advance. So it's, it's really good to be able to just turn up and have those, those staff that will, you can throw a bit of a spanner and say, Oh, we're going to do this tonight or we'll do this tomorrow or this is coming off. And everybody, um, everyone jumps in and yeah, it's, uh, I don't know. It's like when you start, when you own a house as opposed to renting it and being able to hammer a nail into the wall. There's something, um, something of your own. Uh, yeah, there's a. I still wake up and I love coming here. Yeah, it's. Um, yeah, and we. I feel like we are helping out the um, community of Blackheath quite a lot. I think um, any small business does. And there's, uh, yeah, there seems to be quite a lot happening up in Blackheath. We've got a. Uh, a new wine bar that's a cellar door slash wine bar that's opening up across the road from um, Bob Coleman, who produces the, um, frankly, Bob made this wine. And uh, there's another uh, vinyl, I think it's called Vinyl B. It's a, about to open next week, a little cocktail listening bar, which is opening up on the highway, which is something I don't think would ever have happened in the Blue Mountains, say, five yeah, five, ten years ago. That's so cool. Wow. It's, yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's really nice to be part of part of something. I think I've always loved the Blue Mountains. I think the food, it's always been a good food scene up here. I think it's, um, well, it's, well, it's like an hour and a fi- hour and 15 from the city, but it, at some times it has felt maybe 10 years behind. But I think there's a, there's a really good culture up here of some, um, yeah, fantastic suppliers producers and um little restaurants and bars opening up that's so cool great to be part of that and yeah i'm sure to be inspiring people in the region um you know you, you've had a f- quite a few years in the industry will like and you know as you sort of noted things have changed over time just in terms of you know the hours that people are doing and perhaps the career paths that people can go on i mean what do you say to young chefs who are coming through about you know what they might aspire to or hope for in their own careers yeah i um i really um i've got an apprentice that started with me a first year apprentice uh last year and um i think i think for the young chefs the idea that you can travel the world and you can work anywhere um and take it seriously i i you know, I think there was a few years there where maybe I didn't take it as serious as maybe I should have. And uh, but I think that comes with the hospitality industry as well, and the partying and going out and whatnot. And um, but no, I, I think you, especially with TAFE, I think TAFE is such a is such a pivotal part as well of an apprenticeship. I think there's certain things that you'll learn at TAFE that you won't learn at a restaurant. You know, it's all dependent on what type of cuisine you're doing and what food you're doing and um yeah in terms of hours look i don't know it's a tough one i think if i would have got paid for every single hour i did i probably would have had my own restaurant 10 years ago but i wouldn't i wouldn't change a thing i don't think i ever i never got into the to being a chef and hospitality industry to um yeah never asked how much i was getting paid or whatever hours but you know that's that that's me, and that's uh, a lot of chefs I know that I grew up with. Um, but I think it's I think it's important. I think it's a good change that I try to um, any full time staff. You know they do thirty eight hours, and if they don't, they do a little bit more than 
that's accounted for. Um, and then in, you know, in, in terms of, I feel like a, a lot more relaxed as I get older. I know I certainly missed out on so many um, parties and gigs and things like that that generally would happen on the weekend. So, yeah, having a team now that, you know, if they give me enough notice, they can always have a Saturday off and or Sunday or whatnot. And, yeah, I think um, – I think it's really, I think it's a fantastic industry. I really do. And I'm glad to be part of it. And, um, yeah, I wouldn't change a thing, I think, from from my past. And where the where the industry is going, I think it's a, I think it's a good thing. Yeah. Yeah, love it. Oh, so nice. So to, to be looking back so fondly at the past, but also to be so positive about the future. It's just, a, it's just, yeah, you couldn't really hope for more. Um, Will, thank you so much for sharing with us today. It's been really special to learn more about you and, and what you're up to um, and I hope to see you in the Blue Mountains before too long. Oh, that'd be great. Thanks, Danny. This is Dirty Linen and I'm Danny Vallant. We air the issues that the hospitality industry finds hard to talk about, hearing from different people with unique perspectives. We want to hear from you as well. If you have something that needs to be said about a topic, get in touch so we can include your perspective. Contact us at dirtylinen at deepintheweeds.com.au or hit us up on Insta at Dirty Linen Podcast. We can't wait to hear from you. This.